where we left. So what we saw in the previous session was that we saw how to add a new role to a Windows machine. So that will be a similar type when you go across the operating system. That is, you work, say, on a Windows Server 2016, or also you work on Windows Server 2022. So you will have a similar interface. The only thing that may change is your IS version. So that may be uh, 11 in 2022, and in the previous, it may be uh, 9, that is in 2016. So those software versions may change. So with your .NET. So those are be the only changes that you might see, but the ways to get it installed and configure would remain the same, will not differ. Now we will check and we will see Linux. So in the morning itself, I also provisioned a Linux machine. Uh, now, one thing that you need to know is that when you create a machine, so the, the way I connected that was your RDP port, that was 339, sorry, 3389. That is the RDP port I connected on. When it comes to Linux, you do not have a remote desktop. You need to connect to its console. One moment, let me just locate where is my VM gone. Okay, seems like I didn't get it provisioned. So, okay, we'll be creating it. So, same step will follow as we did before. I'll just select the OS so that save time on that. Okay, so one of the changes you'll notice that the inbound port has changed. So it's SSH 22. You do not have a GUI on Windows, on sorry, on Linux. And but that's not mandatory. You can have a GUI installed also on a Linux machine, but it does not serve any purpose because most of these softwares you will be managing with the help of your CLI itself. That's the reason you do not see you, you do not see a GUI on Linux machines. And sorry, yes, one thing we forgot to discuss when we are discussing Windows, even Windows does come with a non-desktop edition, that is a console only edition. So that is something that Microsoft has picked from the Linux operating system, where people need to concentrate more on the services rather than on the UI and configuration. So because of that, you do have the option of running Windows also as without GUI, just a CLI version. So there are remote management tools and all available on Windows.
so management is still required though it may be local or it may be remote so management of a machine is always required and there are several tools available which help you with that okay this will take a minute to provision the machine now if you try to access the site i had shared earlier that will be down because i have turned off the machine so like we discussed i will not leave it running on because that incurs cost for me if i go back to my windows machine you can see it says stopped i have already turned it off so you will not be able to access anything onto that it is completely turned off now if i turn open my remote desktop client it was the ip address that we had it will not connect now anymore because the machine is turned off and cannot be accessible anymore this will time out eventually and tell the machine remote machine is not reachable okay like the same message okay uh the linux machine is now provisioned so now i'll connect it now to connect to a linux machine the most common tool that is used is putty you can call it putty putty anything you want it's a proper noun so you are free to call it with your name how we want to pronounce it most commonly it's called as putty it's a free tool that you can download and utilize on your machine yeah this is the first time i'm connecting to the machine so security is something key that is around all machines that are configured so linux also though being an open source endorses security the so security is everywhere so before i also connect to the machine it will ask me to verify the server key this is a key that is generated on the machine generally an administrator can share that with you and you can verify it before you accept the connection i don't have created this machine that's why i will go ahead and accept next i need to log in now coming to the login on a linux machine so when i was creating the machine you must have seen it gave me two options one is the password login and second is a key based login the key is an encrypted way of logging in where you do not share the password with anybody only the people who have the key can access the machine so that is the most common way that you can you see you will generally see people logging on to the linux machines you would generally not be seeing password but password is convenient and is suitable for our session now since you are using linux this does not limit you on the number of people who can access the console should i share with you my username password and give you this ip address you all all can log in to the machine at the same time so like we discussed windows has licenses for each and everything also for logging on to the machine you require a separate license and also a service to be configured so this is one of the native services that you get on a linux system that's known as sshd this is the secure shell a daemon that allows you to use a secure shell connection to the server and execute remote commands now this is how your console will look whenever you access the linux system even if you install it locally on your machine this is how it will generally look if you do not select the desktop edition or uh, that is you do not install the desktop now desktop is always optional in linux if i want i can get a desktop as well configured right on this machine i just need to install the proper libraries that are required by this machine so it doesn't stop me from having a desktop 
However, since this is on the cloud, and I'll be mostly running applications, that is web applications that people would be accessing remotely. And I do not need a GUI on it. That I will just install and configure the softwares that I need and execute on this system. A couple of things that you need to learn on this. So now since now I'm using a uh, CentOS, that is a derivative of Red Hat. So I can use any of the Red Hat commands and those as well will work on this. Now there is a difference when you are using CentOS and say Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is a different flavor. Likewise, Suzy also is a different flavor. The way the packages are maintained is a bit different. You can always use Google as your reference. So say that I want to install say an Apache web server. Apache is a common web server that used that's again open source and freely available. You can use it to host websites on both Windows and Linux. They are not limited by the operating system when it comes to Apache. It has both Windows binaries and also Linux binaries. So the main difference will come with your package manager. So in the more later Linux, like Linux CentOS 8, you have DNS. Whereas when it comes to Ubuntu, you will have YUM. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, you will have YUM as the uh, package manager. Uh, sorry, that's app kit. There are so many flavors that's a bit difficult to remember that. So I'll show you the comparison. Yes, so you will get a lot of good help topics. So since this is an open source software, you'll have a lot of community links on how to get things installed. Now you see for Windows, I did not need to go anywhere because Windows had all the guides already within itself and also gave me a bit summary. For Linux, you need to do a bit of digging because you do not have everything on the system, but it is robust. You do have a good deal of community support for that. And once you get a hang of, it's much easier to operate. So for installing Apache on Ubuntu, it is sudo apt. So apt is a package manager that is available on Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is another leading distribution of Linux. Sudo, sudo says that you need an elevated command prompt, that you use an elevated command or run it as a root user. That is the main user on a Linux system. So when it comes to Windows, you have the administrators that have the highest access. Ubuntu uh, and Linux works a bit differently. You can have users with administrative access, but that is generally not given. Rather, you will let the users assume the role of the root, that is the main administrator on a Linux machine, and make the required configuration changes onto the system. So that is one of the main differences that you will see between Windows and Linux. In Lin Windows, whereas you will make a person an administrator, you'll make an account an administrator and let that user install whatever is required or do the installation himself. Whereas in Linux, you will give the person access to run the setups or installations as an administrator, assuming the role of an administrator. Otherwise, whenever user logs in, he cannot do privileged instructions, that is privileged task on the system. Now, when it comes to CentOS, we mostly see DNF commands or YUN. Yes, so it's DNF, the predecessor that is in CentOS 7. The package manager was known as YUM, and that is YUM. And now we have DNF. 
commands would be nearly the same, but since they are different package managers, they work in a different way. Now, what does the package manager do? The package manager is responsible for managing the dependencies. Just like we saw in Windows, the dependency was taken care of by the server manager. Likewise, this is the package manager in Linux. Anything I want to install, the package manager will check whether all the required libraries for that particular package is available. Not available, it would arrange for it to be downloaded and then get it and then only it will let you install that particular software. If a particular package that the software dependent on is not available, it will not allow you to install the package. The package installer that comes on Ubuntu is the Debian system, whereas the installer that comes on and CentOS or Red Hat system is known as RPM. Now, since we have the package manager, we need not run the RPM commands. We can directly run these package manager commands that will do the activity for us. The simple thing to do for me to install an Apache server, I just copy this command line. I paste it onto my partition and hit enter. Okay, this so thing first thing it says that I do not have privileges to run this command. Now, when I logged into a Windows server, you see, as soon as I launched the PowerShell, it showed me that I was running the PowerShell as an administrator. It did not ask me to go and elevate the permissions. Whereas Linux is more built around security, it will not run anything as the administrator until you tell it so. The same command, if I need to execute, I need to say sudo. The sudo will run the command, su stands for super user, and do is to do something. So I'm telling over here, super user to do a install. Now before you even start the install, it will check whether the package is available or not. Now you can see over here, the package that is installing is HTTPD. Yes, now you will say that the name that you wanted to install was Apache. But I'm installing a package HTTPD because this is what the name has been since the inception of Apache packages into the repository. So these updates of these packages are hosted by the community that is providing you these operating systems. So CentOS has its own community servers from where it searches and installs these packages. Likewise, Red Hat, then you have Ubuntu, just Suzy, they have their own package repository. Now this is again from an internet source where it is searching these packages. You can see over here, it points out to a URL. So this is the CentOS mirror from where it's fetching the data. For Windows, the package was already available on the system. That's why I didn't need to go to the internet and download and install anything. Whereas on Linux, this is a minimal installation that we have selected. The installation size is very small. It does not have any sort of software other than the SSD that is running and maybe some packages that are required for Azure to operate. Those are installed and configured onto the server. Remaining, nothing is installed. I need to install everything else that is required by me. Here I can see that it allows that for the Apache server to be installed, I require another six packages along with that, that it depends upon and then it will install the Apache D package. What is Apache used for? Apache is your web server on the Linux operating system. Like we install IIS on Windows, a simple of the software that I'm installing over here is HTTPD. Likewise, you can also install SQL Server, that is ML SQL Server. It is now available for Microsoft to install Microsoft products on Linux system. 
that is one of the big products that have been migrated to the Linux systems. Then you also can install several other softwares or there are other open source database engines that you can install like MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle is also available to install on Linux systems. They have rather their own operating system that they give bundled with their database systems. Now to go ahead and install, all I need to do is press yes and give my confirmation. It shows you the amount of data it's going to download. It says 2M. Just 2MB is going to download from the internet. The total installation size after downloading would be 5.5 MB. That's the last two lines that you see down here. Okay, now since this is on the cloud, it has a good bandwidth. It quickly downloaded and got everything installed. Yes, it goes as fast as this is, depending again on your machine that you have. Does not take much time to get anything installed and configured. Now I can access this port again on the internet. Okay, so right now it will not allow. I need to allow the port on my firewall. Now, yes, so. Once again, now when we did a Windows installation, we did not discuss about firewall because in Windows by default, all the ports are open. Your firewall is turned off. In the later editions of Windows, it's a bit more strict where by default, the port is always turned off rather than allowed. Now the option that I've selected here, yes, this will come in your networking class, so please be patient. Okay, so now when I refresh, it will still not connect. Why? One, because the server is not yet made available. The server has not been started, it's only been installed. I also need to get the server up and running. That is the next command over here. The simple copy paste. If this starts your HTTP D server, still when I hit, I should not be able to access the server. Okay, it's come now. It's available. So I'm able to hit the test page. Same thing. If I share the URL with you, you will be able to access this page from your machine, whether you're in the office, outside the office, not on the VPN. Anyway, you should be able to access this URL. So this is again a public cloud server that I have prepared because I'm able to access. Now, how do you know that this server is being hosted by me only? It could be some other server as well. I can make a quick change on the server page. Now this teaches you something more when it comes to Linux. So by default, the now we are going to navigate to the file system on a Linux operating system. So this is a command that lists everything ls within your system. So this is my root file system. All your file structures in a Linux system start from the root. That is a slash of backslash. You have the boot, etc, dev. Home, etc. etc is the folder where all your configuration files go. Home is where your user files will go. That is your home, your desktop would lie on. So when you compare with the Windows system, home is like your desktop. So all your files related to the user would be in the home directory. Now remember once again, this is not a quit, so I cannot double click and go anywhere. Everything is command line based. So now what I'm going to do is go and modify the file that is being hosted on my Apache server. So the path where the default location goes is in where slash www uh, HTML. Now how do I know this path? This path is default for all Apache servers. 
if i do not know that i can always check on it in the communities that's the second place where you can check Say the way of where www.html. You can definitely change it. It's not that you cannot change it, but that is the default path, path where it creates the files. Okay, this is empty right now. I'll just put in a quick index page. Where ls, I'll check there are no files. Now the editor that you get on Linux, so you see these all things I did not take on Windows because most of you wouldn't be familiar with Windows. You have Notepad, then you know how to browse into your system. You know how to open the folders. Whereas on Linux, it's a bit different. So now I'm creating a file over here. Once again, I will use sudo. Why? Because this folder does not belong to me. You can see it belongs to the root. This is another thing you should see when I'm running the command. This folder belongs to the root. You can see the permission set over here. It says DRWX. What does that mean? D stands for your directory. The first one is your directory, telling that this thing is a directory. Okay, so this thing is a directory. Then stands your R. R stands for read. W stands for write. And X stands for execute. So on this folder user, this is our directory, first of all, because it has a D. Then it has RWX, R hyphen X, R hyphen X. What does this mean? The first three RWX, this stands for the owner. The owner has write, read, write, and execute access on this particular folder. The next one stands for the group that is a group members so this is uh, this will be your owner and the second one will be your group to which the user belongs to or the folder belongs to so this is a group permission the second are hyphen x and the last one is for everyone else who do not fall within the owner or the group so the remaining people have read access and execute access so this also can be changed. Yes, that's a very big topic. But just to have a general idea, just sharing this part with you. In Windows, it's a bit different. You have item level permission that you can define. So when I go and right click on any Windows folder, you go to properties. So this is same for your server operating system also. So I don't need to launch a server operating system for that. Okay, this will not allow me to check the permissions. Now on my system, I am not an administrator, so I cannot see the permissions. Okay, this is power on my Windows machine. I let it power on, it'll take some time. Okay, meanwhile, we'll continue with the Linux. So I need to create a file so that you can validate that this file has been created by me. The command that I will use over here is vim. Vim is a text editor available in Linux. You can either write vi also. That's another text editor. And you have vim. I will run it at sudo. Why? Just for the reason because I do not have access on this folder. When I look into this folder, it says DRWX, that is the owner has write access, and remaining only have read and execute access. So because of that, I will not be able to create anything into this folder because I cannot write. So I'll execute this as a root user. I will give the file name index.html. Now I'm going to put basic HTML code onto this. So that the site is so I can view something on the site. To start editing, I need to press I. So when I, as soon as I press I, you can see down the cursor turns 
to insert. Now I'll type in the code. So pardon me if my HTML is not correct. In some time I'm seeing HTML now. H1 works. I need to put a backslash. So remember, this, I've got a very basic code. I just want to see whether my website is working. I expect not. Yes, sorry. Uh, I just exited it. So when I'm done from insert, I press shift and pull. Or oh, that is the two dots above the semicolon. And I think so the second key after enter, I press first and escape. Then the colon, shift and colon. Okay, one moment. Okay, let's get shift and colon. Then I do a WQ. WQ stands for write and quit. If I want to quit the file without making any changes, I can just type Q. Whereas I want to write the file and save the changes, I will put in W and Q. That's it, my file is written. Now I can just come here and refresh the page. Okay, so this is my website. Basic text I've put, so I'm not a very good developer, so I just put very good. I just put a basic text so that you can verify that this is my site that where you're heading. And this is again publicly accessible. So you can just refresh this IP address on your page and it will be visible. Now, who was watching the recording would definitely not see the same site. Because by that time, I would have deleted this particular instance. So you would not get to see the site running. But this is as simple to get started on Linux. Yeah, we have not covered much. Yeah, this is just to give you a basic idea how Linux works. Now, where is this configuration file? We will have a look at ETC as well. ETC would have all the softwares loaded all their configuration within their configuration folders. You can also have it out dumped into the root of ETC, but generally it's a good practice and all package managers install the configuration files into their respective folders. So as HTTPD, these are the configuration files that you can see that are present. So I have three folders, you can see config, config D, config dot modules. And you can see one more type of folder is available that says L. L stands for symbolic link. Symbolic link means this is pointing to a different location. For example, logs is pointing to actually where slash log slash HTTPD. Similarly for the other folders, just go into the config folder. Now, when I see into this folder, you see I do not have the files that are present, do not have the first parameter set. That's because these are the actual files within the folder. Once again, if you see the permission, they are read write. Read write for whom? For the root. It's read for others. And again, read, sorry, read for the group members. And again, read for everyone else. Now, once again, managing your users and groups in Linux is a bit, again, it's better if you use the online help. Once you know the commands at hand, it will be easier for you to navigate. On Windows, again, once a machine comes up, I'll show you how you can manage that part. Before that, let's see the configuration. So you have two options now. I could do a VIM and edit the file HTTPD, but I do not want to modify the file. 
where I say just want to see the contents. So just see the contents, I can do a cat. This is another command that is very useful. You just want to see the contents of a file. You say cat, specify the file name, hit enter. This will list down all the files, all the entire contents of the file. Now the most specific thing that we are looking at over here is the directory of the HTTP, that is the root of your Apache server. Okay. Here it is. So this shows me the default document root. The default document root is at where www slash html. Now, when you configure a Linux and especially an Apache website, it would definitely not be that you would have just one website running on a machine. You would have several websites, or you can say you would have several web servers hosted on a single machine. So you all the several websites that are hosted on the machine, you can have them configured with an unique name. Yes, Apache again is a very huge topic. So I'll just give an overview. You can configure different host names like something like you say a google.com or a hotmail.com or microsoft.com on one Apache server. So this, that can be done. You can host the servers on several ports. That is, you can host them on different ports, but you would most likely share your port 80 because most of the browsers would not access on, enter, uh, on a custom port. They would always access on a port 80. Let's see how we can manage the users and groups on Linux. Once again, you can just go to the online help. Okay, so you have a folder in etc slash group that says it has all the groups listed in them. So I do not want to modify the file, so I'll just say etc. I just do a cat to that file. So this shows you a list of groups that are available on the system. I know it's not very attractive way of seeing the groups on a system, it's very it's basic. It's on your command shell. You will see that there is a name, and then you have a number in front of that. What does that mean? The number is your group ID. So every user or group that is created on Linux system would have an ID associated with it. That is how the system identifies a user on the system. Whereas when you come to Windows, I think my machine should be on now. So Windows obviously has a GUI, and that's why it will give me a good interface for the user management as well. So there are several ways you can come to the user management, but I will go to computer management. Now, what we are going to see over here is uh, local users and groups. 
So these users and groups, like the name says local users and groups, these users and groups are located on the machine itself. You have several predefined groups. The main group over here is the administrator, who all has administrative access on your machine. So like we discussed, it will be a custom user. So over here, it's my username that's a administrator on this machine. You can see the users already created on the machine. There is no administrator. So coming to the new operating system, administrator word itself is depreciated, especially coming onto the cloud because that is the most common ID on a Windows system. And that is the ID that is targeted for a password guest. So whenever a password needs to be exploited, they will always target an administrator ID on a Windows system. So you see the administrator ID itself is not there. So I'm the administrator over here, where is the Linux? The administrator ID will always be root and that cannot be disabled. However, you can disable the root from a remote login or even login at the local console. That is something you can do on a Linux system and you can always use a sudo, that is a remote proxy, a user proxy to run privilege commands on a Linux system. Now, when it comes to users on a Linux system, again, it's an ETC. That's a different file name. It's the password D file name. So this has a list of users that are currently configured on the system along with a home path. So like I discussed, the home path is within home. And then the username or default console, that is your shell program is also specified. So you're having a shell scripting session that will most probably be in bash. The bash is a shell that is available on Linux. There are several shells available. The most common is bash. Also, PowerShell is nowadays available on Linux. So this could also be a PowerShell. We are not limited to only the bash, uh, the bash commandlet. You can also use PowerShell nowadays on Linux. Next is my GUID. This is my unique ID on the machine. You can see it's set to 1000. And this is my username. Apart from my username, there are several other users. So you can see the list of users that are by default created. So another concept that you will see in Linux is that every session or every program that is executed generally would have its own user. The last program that we installed and configured was Apache. So you can see I have a user for Apache as well. However, when you come to the bin configuration, it says no login because this user is just meant to run your Apache server and nothing else. So because of that, it is not supposed to log in and no console application has been assigned to it. Likewise, the home for it is in user share HTTPD. It's not at the standard home because you do not expect the user to log in. It's only meant to run a service. Likewise, you'll see many of the users up over here, they all have no login for their shell program because they are not supposed to log in onto the system. Well, my user has a shell program configured because I am supposed to log into the system for managerial activities. We discussed about the root user. So you can see the root user is available right over here. This is a root group, sorry. So the root group that we first, we check the group. And likewise, you also find the root user in the file password of the, yeah, yeah, just. The root user will always have an ID of zero. Any Linux operating system you take, let it be a Ubuntu, let it be a CentOS, let it be a Red Hat or Suzy, 
you will always have the root user with the ID zero. And likewise, the group also will be created with the same ID zero. And that will always be the super user in an Linux operating system. Now the question comes, root is common on all operating systems. Wouldn't that be a vulnerability? Yes, it is. And the community is aware of it. Because of that, you cannot log in in most of the systems with the root. When you go to Ubuntu, the root or login is completely disabled. You cannot log in as a user root, but since you need it for administrative purposes, you can use the root user to sudo and run administrative activities on it. Now, not as good and good looking as like in Windows where you can manage your users and group. But yes, Linux has its own purpose when compared to Windows. So that's why both Windows and Linux are used in tandem depending upon your use case. We have to just see one more topic that is the permission sets. When you come to Windows, let me just select a file. Okay. Yeah. Let me go to the root. If I come to security, so this is how your permissions look for each folder or file. You'll have several usernames or groups associated with it. You can edit the permissions. Yeah, you again have a GUI to do it. So it's not mandatory that you have Windows you need to do on a GUI itself. You can also do via CLI. They are equivalent, equivalently good PowerShell commands available for you to manage your Windows system. However, it's not mandatory that you make use of CLI with Windows. You can make use of the quid also. But when you have certain repetitive tasks, you may might want to think of using PowerShell as an alternative to those two activities. OK, so this gives you a very brief introduction to both Linux and Windows. So this is not a complete guide that you have learned about Windows and Linux. So this is just a very brief overview, obviously. Linux and Windows both are quite deep. There's a lot to explore, a lot to learn. So hope this gets you started and you are able to explore it yourself. Uh, do you have any questions? Any questions? Okay, no worries. So there is also a good deal of networking and security concepts that comes around both your Windows and Linux machines. So by default on Azure, since Azure has its own firewall, it does not enforce the firewall on the operating system of the guest OS. However, you are free to go and also enable the firewall on your guest OS so that you can have more better control on your operating system and what are connecting to it. Yes, so that's another topic that we can see. It's very easy when it comes to Windows. Just right click, go to your network and settings. Now again, this is the same for your Windows machine as well, your Windows 10 machine as well as the server operating system. So this is common across all operating systems. You can allow an app to a firewall. You can go to advanced settings. You have different settings depending upon the public network, private network, or domain network. Now, since we are on the cloud, it says a public network. If I restrict the file one and allow it only to work internally, it could be a private network or domain network. I have it connected to a domain system, it will become a domain network. 
okay, the firewall rules. You have inbound, outbound rules. When you come to inbound rules, so these are all the rules for the requests that are coming into the server. Now, I did not come over here and check whether HTTP port is open. That is, you can access from the internet because by default, I know it would be open. These are some common ports which are always open on a system. This is the RDP port, that is a remote desktop port to which I have currently connected. If I disable it from here, I will not be able to connect to the machine from outside. Sorry, it was the last rule over here. Worldwide services traffic in, HTTP traffic in. So this was an HTTP traffic that I triggered. So when we hit the URL for HTTP, now once again my server is online. So if you put 20.120.8.2423 from your browsers, you will reach the default web page that's hosted on IS. Now that is I can configure. Okay, so this is a default IS page. So I can just modify this. Once again, I will use my basic HTML skills. Now I can access this server and just copy its IP address and paste it into my browser. With the same page that I just modified, you can see now it is visible for everyone and it is being served on the internet. If I have any other content, I'm free to go and post it onto that server. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so I open both the URLs on my machine for your reference. And now at the end of the day, what I do is I go and delete the machines. But first I will stop it to show now the site is no longer accessible. Okay, first of all, my Windows machine will disconnect. It's gone. Same thing I will do to the Linux machine as well. This will disconnect my prompt. Put the prompt has closed. Both the machines have gone down now. So if I refresh on the pages, They will not be able to fetch any data. Okay, so this will time out eventually, and you will not be able to see anything. Okay, one has timed out, it cannot be reached. The other one also has timed out, it cannot be reached because now I've turned off the servers that it was hosted on. Okay, so any questions now? Okay, no worries. So if you have any questions, please use the community. Of course, so this has not covered all the topics of Windows and Linux. There is still a lot to explore. But however, this gets you started. If you get your basics of understanding how Windows and Linux works, what are the costs associated with it, when you need to select what, and what are the impact it has.
so there is no good operating system so you can tell that there is no good or bad operating system sorry so it's up to your function your requirements according to that you can decide what operating system you need to use for hosting your applications and now going beyond that in this modern age you also get serverless architectures without having our root operating system where you can host your websites or your applications so that's the next level so even without an operating system or having access to the host you are able to do all your functions able to host your apps and do various things that you need to do for your application so that's the next level that's coming up